Hello, my name's Adam, and I'm a librarian at the Windsor Public Library, and I'm very excited today to be speaking with local poet and memoirist Robert Earl Stewart. Robert holds a BA in English Language and Literature from the University of Windsor and an MA in English Literature from McGill University. He spent 15 years as a newspaper reporter, photographer, and editor at the Windsor Star and the LaSalle Post. His first collection of poetry was released by Mansfield Press in 2009. That was Something Burned Along the Southern Border. It was shortlisted for the Gerald Lampard Memorial Award. It was followed by a second collection, Campfire Radio Raspity, also released by Mansfield Press in 2011. In 2022, Dundurn Press published his memoir, The Running Shaped Hole. His poetry has appeared in magazines, journals, and anthologies throughout Canada, the US, and the UK. And I'm very glad to welcome Robert here for our discussion for Poetry Month. Hello, Robert. How are you? Thanks for having me. Very good. Thank you. I was just wondering if we could start off. I heard you have a new piece you would like to share with us today. I do. I have a, an unpublished poem. Uh, I can read it for you. It's called On Leaving My Son's Birthday to Grieve a Poet and Musician I Never Met in a Bar in Another Country. My copy of Actual Air was out on loan, carrying its message to someone who needed you when you died. Its space on the shelf like a slip for the hateful lean vessel of our loss. And in that thin chasm that will go on forever, I stopped listening to your music for like an hour. It was my son's 17th birthday, and I went out in search of a photo. I took American water with me to leaven the old heat of early August where a friend in Kentucky said he would not be able to handle a Louisville art opening if forced to continually retell his grief. He will take hugs, he said, but he will not remove his sunglasses for anyone. His grief without mouth or eyes, dumb and blind and waiting in the garden described in that grand old hymn to turn stranger in the face of an unspeakable peace come to slake his torment. I find two dogs tied to a wrought iron fence in Ford City, a dog de Bordeaux and a Rottweiler named Wednesday, waiting for their owner to emerge from an ice cream parlor and share with them from a small chair in the sun, their mouths all the same for a moment and captured in a dark cup of my hands. You'd posted a photo of a dog on a sea grape lined path down to a beach that day, and I commented that it was beautiful my favorite from your brief curation. And you said, thank you. And then presumably set to packing for your tour. Tonight, there's an open mic eulogy at a bar in Detroit. I probably wouldn't know anyone there but you. And my firstborn is turning 17. People are coming over for cake and remarks. Your kingdom came and you were all alone, just like in a bar where neither of us belong. I'd rather be alone in my grief and surrounded by the kind of oblivious love that lives in the incense of blown out candles than in a room of strangers flexing their undergrads over you in absentia. Forgive them, they mean well, but we both know you died of this. Thank you, Robert. Uh, that was powerful. And I'm assuming, probably correctly, that that was about the recently deceased singer, songwriter, and poet David Berman. That is, that is who it is about. Yes, uh, I uh, obviously a, a fan of his poetry and his music. Uh, I never met him, but we do have some friends in common uh, through mostly through musical circles, actually. And uh, yeah, there's um, I'm often, you know. The, the death of, of writers and uh, musicians, uh, very few have hit me uh, as hard and as personally as that one in uh, a couple of years ago in August. 2019, I think, August 2019. I know before we spoke a bit about Berman, and I don't want to say as much his influence, but his effect on you. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of perhaps an influence on your writing, or maybe even just a, a motivator 
for your own poetry. What what was Berman's effect on you? Uh, well, I first came across him uh, through mu his music. Uh, his he uh, his book uh, Actual Air uh, that came out in the late nineties, and uh, I ordered a copy. I wasn't really a per I was, you know, an English major in uh, just finishing up grad school at the time, but I was definitely more focused on fiction. I was uh, studying American fiction. Uh, I just thought it was all it would almost be like a lark to have this poetry book. So it arrived at my house, I put it on a shelf, years went by. Uh, like, I don't think I other than maybe flipping through it and like, hmm, interesting. I put it on a shelf because I wasn't a reader of poetry. In 2004, uh, our son was about two years old. Uh, it was his second birthday, as a matter of fact. And we used to have a, right outside in our backyard is right here. We had a little pool for him, a waiting, you know, it was a an inflatable waiting pool, but it was pretty big. Like you could get a bunch of people in it. And uh, I liked to go out there and sit and read in the water. You know, you could sit on the, you know, and the water would come up to here and you could hold a book. And I decided I'm going to read. Uh, we're going to read that David Berman uh, poetry book today. And I went out and I was sitting in the pool reading it. And uh, you know, I'd owned it for probably about five years at this point. And uh, the 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 effect that it had was very. Uh, there was an immediate affinity to the poetry. Now I was looking at it and I was I was just kind of reading it and feeling it and uh, kind of felt like I, I was almost living it, that it was relating to me in a really direct way. And within minutes, I know it sounds like uh, it sounds it, it is almost literally the uh, the definition of inspiration to be like breathed into within minutes. I was upstairs writing a poem about my son. Uh, learning how to hit a baseball off of a tee like a, that we got him for his birthday earlier that day. And uh, that poem within a couple months was published in a journal in California, along with another poem that I wrote like a couple of days later. And so here I was all this time, I'd been struggling to write uh, fiction, writing fiction, but not getting any of it published, just kind of grinding it out and sending it off and getting rejections. And then I read this David Berman poetry one day in my backyard. I write two poems. I send them to a journal in California, and I'm a published poet. So uh, so the poetry started flowing. And uh, like I said, although I never met David Berman, uh, his poetry is certainly uh, something that I, I turn back to often. So I'm actually really glad you brought up that poem, because it's actually one of my favorites of yours. Oh, and. Thank you. I think it expresses themes that I see a lot in your works, which is this kind of um, finding profundity in the quotidian or the everyday. Um, what would you make of me saying that? Do you think there's any truth to that? Uh, I think so. I, I And I think I've always kind of been that way, you know, uh, you know, that, that's just a natural uh, line of thought for me. And, uh, you know, you often can't, I think maybe, you know, growing up, you know, Maybe maybe not so much high school, but before that, like when you were a you know a child, uh, there was a hesitation to say those kind of things. So you might notice something. I might have noticed something and thought, you know, <laughs> a, a shorthand for poetry is always like this is like this, and this is like this, and you know, you're. I was constantly doing that in my head, but I guess maybe I thought it was uh, strange or in a not inappropriate, but just like something that little boys certainly shouldn't be doing. And I, and I wasn't raised with that kind of like, you know, boys do this and girls do this. I certainly wasn't raised that way, but, you know, just in peer groups and in, you know, the, you know, the classrooms of the 1980s, you know, uh, I think I kept a lid on things like that and just kind of let it, maybe it was a good thing. Maybe it simmered and uh, turned into something that by the time I was in my, uh, more teenage years and university years, I was able to turn into, you know, at first it was it was lyrics for uh, for a band I was in, and then it was short stories, and then it became poetry. So, yeah. So this is very interesting because most poets I've talked to, they've talked about this 
long linear path, writing when they're young, advancing in their teen years and their early 20s. But you really had uh, a point where you began later in life for uh, writing poetry, at least compared to prose. In terms of your process of writing poetry, what does that look like? It's interesting because sometimes, you know, I will wonder from time to time if I'll ever write another book of poetry. Uh, the first two books of poetry, the ones you mentioned in uh, in your intro, uh, they came out quite in short order, 2009, 2011. And, uh, you know, I started to immediately become concerned about, about what is the third book of poetry going to be like? What is that going to look like? Because I often, and I still feel to this day, that the, the first two books, it's kind of like part one and part two. The second book, actually, you know, I'm not revealing any kind of trade secrets here. A lot of the, not a lot, but some of the poems in the second book are like cast-offs from the first book that weren't ready yet. Mm -hmm. And you go back to them, you edit them, you change them, and, you know, they became better poems and were published in the second book. So there's a similarity of feel uh, between the first two books. And I became very worried about is the uh, is the third book, go it needs to take some kind of leap. I felt it needs to take some kind of stylistic or formal or uh, thematic leap. And there's a, I would speak to people in Toronto, let's say poets I know in Toronto who would say like, it really ha needs to have a rigorous thesis. Your, your, whatever your next book is, it, you know, it's like you have to take on an issue. There has, it has, there has to be some central issue. And then I would talk to some other poets that I know, uh, say, let's say not in Toronto, who would say uh, the next book of poetry is just the next book of poetry. It doesn't, you know, themes will emerge and they will just, it'll be what it is. And although I kind of liked the sound of that more, I kind of felt that I needed to do the other one because it seemed more uh, serious. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened is, is that the tap that was on, that poetry was pouring out of for several years between, say, 2004 and 2010 or 11, that tap just kind of dried up and... I started writing, I was commissioned to write a memoir by a publisher, uh, about, uh, which is The Rotting Shaped Hole. And uh, so my focus turned to, you know, first person memoir writing. Uh, now the memoir does discuss uh, poetry and, and, and a lot of what I'm saying right now uh, is, is in some way in the memoir, uh, because it was an important part of, uh, you know, you know, it, of the process from moving from, you know, uh, someone who was uh, focused on poetry to someone who is learning how to write a memoir, uh, struggling to write a memoir at times. Um, and, you know, that poem I read, I, I read from a file on my computer. I opened it up and I was looking at it on the screen and there's, I'm looking in the file and there's all these poems in this file. Uh, there's probably 60 maybe more. And I'm scrolling through looking for the title of that poem. And I'm looking at all these titles of these poems. I'm like, what is that poem? I don't know what that poem <laughs> is. So I just in the last 10 minutes have discovered, all, rediscovered all these poems that have kind of like, are, you know, I would say almost none of them are in a finished state. Uh, but uh it, maybe it's maybe this is the spark to to go back and revisit the poetry because uh you know it's uh my someone just asked me a couple of weeks ago when is the next book of poetry and i i just laughed and i said i i do not know poetry is a is a finicky thing you, you can't just sit down i i can't at least just sit down and decide i'm writing a poem today where when i was writing the memoir i learned that i could just sit down and decide i was writing the memoir uh, poetry needs to have that moment where you see, you know, what we just talked about, the that sudden connection with uh, with a circumstance or with uh, a snippet of conversation or with uh, two texts that you've read and made a connection between, you know, and you have that urge to write it down in a small notebook. Well, it's probably a poem. And uh, but you got to wait for that moment to happen. So. 
You briefly touched upon it, this difference between writing a memoir or prose and then writing poetry. Can you elaborate on the difference between the two a little bit more? For people especially who may not know the difference, perhaps they only write one form or the other or they don't write at all. What does that feel like for you as a creative difference? Poets are often depicted for, for humor, for comedic value as, you know, sitting alone in cafes, like watching people and, you know, hunched over little notebooks and, and writing mysteriously. And uh, although that's a lot, there's a lot of kind of romantic uh, cinematic effect there. Uh, it's kind of true. Um, I, I can go to a cafe or sit at a bench in a park and bring my little notebook and bring my pen and maybe bring someone else's book of poetry. Nothing inspires poetry like reading other poetry and, uh, and write a poem out in the world. Uh, but writing prose, uh, I find until very recently, I found very difficult to do uh, other than sitting at home at my desk where I have my computer. I have like all these notebooks and manuscripts and various colored pens. It's a big production for me. It seems to be more like work. Uh, poetry is <laughs> poetry can almost appear to be indolence, you know, uh, sitting under the tree waiting for waiting for inspiration where for me, prose is very work focused. Uh, but I, you know, I can touch on, I, there is a, recently I started, I wrote the first draft of a, a fiction manuscript, mm. long, Longhand. Uh, I have a problem of editing myself too much in the moment where mm. I'm, I'll write a sentence on the computer and you can, infant just because it's, uh, you know, movable type and things like that on the screen. You can just dither around with the same set of words in a paragraph all afternoon and get nowhere. Hmm. Uh, and I realized that's like, that's more like second draft, third draft kind of stuff. Get the bones of the story down. And I've heard this advice for like 30 years. Get the bones of the story down. Don't worry about editing in the moment. And then go back. And that's when you can start worrying about, does this sentence sound right? Does that sentence go with that? And uh, so that's what I did. It's 500. I wrote it out longhand, 519 pages. It took 118 days. And I, for the first time ever, I set myself deadlines too. Like, uh, I guess I, I kind of fit into a certain kind of stereotype about writers is that we're very, uh, I, I haven't been a very rigorous worker at times. Uh, you know, there's lots of things that get in the way of that, but like I said, I, I've often just uh, not done the work. You know, I, I do a lot of reading. I, uh, I'm always thinking about writing, uh, but I had to get down and, and take some long standing advice very, very seriously. And that was, you know, just force yourself to do it, make yourself a schedule, set yourself deadlines and stick to them. You know, working at, in newspapers for 15 years, I was all about deadlines on a daily basis. Uh, and maybe that's a little bit of my avoidance too, is that I, that just, it's like, you know, that just seems a little too work a day for, for uh, uh, the poet in me, I guess, but uh, maybe I'm maturing. <laughs> Now, we did touch upon, of course, your memoir. Uh, just before we wrap up the conversation, I'm wondering if you could talk about it a little bit. Yes, uh, The Running Shaped Hole came out in uh, April uh, 2022, so just about a year ago. Uh, for a lot of my adult life, uh, I, was, um, I was very overweight uh, I, at one point. I weighed almost 400 pounds uh, in, say, in 2012 uh, when I was at my heaviest. And I was, uh, I was very sick. I was very sick mentally, emotionally, uh, and, you know, certainly not in good shape physically. Uh, I was immobile, you know. I, I don't want to make it seem like I couldn't leave the house, but it was a chore. It was hard. It was embarrassing. Uh, and I had been a, you know, an athlete in high school. I was on a football player, a baseball player. I was on the swim team, uh, and just the end, <laughs> all this stuff about writing and sitting and writing and, 
and working on a computer, working for 15 years in a newsroom. Uh, I put on over 200 pounds because I wasn't doing a lot. I was, I was doing a lot of reading and sitting and looking at monitors and eating. You know, I was, a, I had a 17 year old boy's uh, appetite and like an 80 year old man's lifestyle. And I, you know, I just, I let it get out of control. It got, you know, it was controlling everything. And uh, to my surprise, and I think this is the surprise of a lot of people, uh, the answer for me was, uh, was in running, distance running. And I started, I, I started keeping this running journal. I was taking this learn to run clinic at the running factory here in Windsor. And one of the pieces of advice they had was keep a journal. So of your various, of your running and your progress. And uh, so I started doing that. And it was at first very kind of data focused. Like this is the date. This is the temperature. I went running uh, for this long and this is where I went. But being, you know, someone who kind of likes story and relates to the world through story, uh, those journals started having anecdotes in them and thoughts. And it started becoming more of a, there was a memoir style to it. And a publisher approached me and said, you know, they would like, they were interested in a book on running. Was I interested in, in my story? And was I interested? And I said, well, I think I'm already kind of writing it in these journals that I'm keeping. So that became uh, that became the running shaped hole. And, uh, you know, I still run. Uh, it's not a how to manual about running. It's a it's a memoir about, uh, you know, like I said, there's a lot in it about my years in a band and then living in Montreal and coming back to Windsor, getting married, starting a family. Uh, it. Uh, there's a lot in it about mental illness and re recovery from alcoholism, and uh, which is a, a whole part of the story. Uh, and I still run today. I, uh, you know, like I said, it's not a it's not a how to manual. It's a book about struggling and failing and uh, trying to change and be, you know finding peace with yourself. Mm -hmm. I would certainly say it is. Uh, having read it, it's a very inspiring book. But as you said, what I appreciate about it so much is the fact that it takes upon uh, a path of self-exploration that I don't think people would be accustomed to from a book about running. It isn't a guide. It isn't a how-to. It is a memoir in the truest sense, and it's a wonderful book. So I do encourage everyone who's watching, if they haven't had a chance to yet, to check out The Running Shaped Hole. You can borrow it from mm -hmm. Windsor Public Library. And Robert, if people want to purchase it, where can they do that? Uh, they can purchase it, uh, you know, at local bookstores like uh, Juniper Books, Biblioasis, uh, River Bookshop in Amherstburg, at the mall, at at uh, at uh, Indigo. You can purchase it online. You can purchase it directly from Dundurn Press. You know, and that's it's available. You know, anywhere anywhere books are sold, as they like to say. So, excellent. Uh, just before we head out, I'm wondering if you could read another selection or two for us. I can. I wish I had the book uh, with the baseball poem uh, right here in front of me. I'd have to run <laughs> upstairs and grab it. But I do have uh, Campfire Radio Rhapsody here, which was uh, the second book of poetry. And uh, last night, I just kind of started leafing through it, wondering, uh, you know, what to read. And I, I came across this poem. Uh, it's uh, kind of about my... in the early 1970s before i was born uh my parents uh went uh went backpacking and hitchhiking through europe as <laughs> it was a thing to do you know in the 70s and they had all these photos in a photo album and uh i think some of my interest in photography comes comes from this photo album but i was obsessed with it as a child i would you know, I would sit on the floor and look through this book of, of photos and uh, the photos were largely of Switzerland, mm -hmm. this particular album. And I was obsessed with it. And uh, years later, uh, following the death of my mother and just looking back, I, I wrote this poem. Uh, the, uh, the title is Loven Denkmal, which means Lion Monument. 
I was conceived in Switzerland. It was the fall of 73 in a hotel at the foot of the Matterhorn. In the lobby, you could buy wooden music box replicas. The paddle wheel turned as Edelweiss played. There are pictures of them hitchhiking. My father has sideburns and Ray-Bans. My mother in her slip in the gloaming room. She looks over her shoulder as she eats something at a small desk. They went there thinking they would never have me. A lion dying in the saddest and most moving piece of rock in the world. A Belgian trucker who sent Christmas cards until one year they stopped. At home, the grass grew imperfectly. Appointment reminders whispered by the phone. These people by the lake and at the airport in Zurich are younger than I am now. The camera these were shot with sits in a cabinet next to a canister in a velvet bag. I spent hours with this album. It was like a memory, like I was in those mountains with them, looking out from the hotel of her stomach. When I see Zermatt, it looks like home. When I see Lucerne, it makes me cry. And I can find quickly uh, one other poem, if you think there's still time. Oh, absolutely. OK. This is one I like to read. It's called A Wind Aided Fire. Pretend it's eight o'clock again. No one's dictating anything. The little cassettes sit stacked in their cases. Forget about the boxes of bullets above the bed in the cabin spare bedroom. Forget about those hunting parties that used to push off from the mooring mast in the prototypes for the flaccid dirigible. Those burgeoning balloonists and their pulleys and ramps and the little men on bikes who raced around the gondola. And if you can, act like we're in the cold desert among nose cones and tail sections, pieces for steering, the skeletons of wings. Re-envision the Commodore. Appreciate his loyalty to hangers-on, the polishing of the screw until it's the very curve of resentment. Luxuriate in how this all started with clowns, clowns and seltzer and tears. Maybe it all started with tears. The tears were definitely there first, like snail silk in the a priori blackness, spooky and silent as an unplugged theremin. Sometimes it's just too easy to pull it all together like this. Take note of some things. The mass exodus of clowns under cover of a wind-aided fire. Those museums in Mexico where the cholera mannequins stand around like ramshackle victims. The black tape, the black boxes, the spinning, and the game you want to learn so you can be found dead playing it. The black outlines of antennas backlit by the city, the low lake levels and the emerging snarl of shopping carts, and then the wind. See them on the move, armed with blackjacks and wigs and false mustaches, foreign and uncertain and conscious of their nudity in the halls of the neighborhoods. But patience, patience and the constancy of storm fronts, patience and the palm bitten nails, patience and the waterborne illness, patience and the lung engulfing plague. We can laugh. We can all make casts of each other's most private places. We can whip ourselves with the lash of the deafening possible and pretend it's still a couple of hours ago. I just want to thank you so much, Robert, for joining us for this conversation. And I just want to encourage everyone watching to check out Robert's works. You can borrow them from Windsor Public Library and, of course, buy The Running Shaped Hole and his poetry books across bookstores throughout your fair city. So again, Robert, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Adam.